Okay, we're starting from the beginning, and let's start from the beginning right now. Joining me is a special guest here on the network. I haven't been on with him before, so I'm happy he's here now. Criminal defense attorney Michael Bachner. Michael, great to see you. Pleasure to be here. So what on earth do you think it's like to defend a case like this with so many moving parts? Well, job of the, prosec the job of the defense lawyer, rather, is to try and compartmentalize your arguments in a way where you can really focus them and get the jury to really understand what that initial argument is. Some defense lawyers feel in cases where it's difficult to defend, they use that old shotgun approach where they throw a lot of stuff up and hope jurors go back there and start arguing with each other and create reasonable doubts or you can try and create them. But a case like this, it's very important in my opinion to focus the argument on really what you believe that reasonable doubt is, really get your evidence in order, hone in on it. And in this case, it would either be the autistic condition of one of the individuals, the Munchausen's um, related uh, issues related with, uh, with Dee Dee, and to really demonstrate that this was a woman, as far as Dee Dee's concerned, who was under an enormous amount of, um, of pressures and, and, and gypsy, et cetera, what those relationships are. And as far as the autistic issues, to really try and create those doubts. A, scatter, a scatterboard approach is not going to work in a case like this. It's a tough job for the defense attorney, but Real let's kind of see what they're up against. So we played a little bit of the prosecution's opening statement. Let's continue on. Okay, uh, important point here, and I want to make sure we get this, Michael. The idea that the prosecution is saying, really, he deliberated on this for about a year. Do you believe, based upon what you've seen in this case, that's an accurate statement that he deliberated on it for quite some time? Are they really making a strong argument by saying this is first degree murder because he did have the opportunity to make a different choice and didn't? Or is the, we'll play the defense's opening statement in a minute, but I'm curious, are they articulating a strong point there? Well, the idea of showing premeditation is obviously very important in trying to demonstrate a, a first degree offense. Um, premeditation, though, and the judge will instruct us to the jury, can be formed in a matter of seconds. So uh, the fact that it's been going on arguably for a year, I think, is important to, first of all, rebut any proposition that this was some type, the, the impact of some type of impulsive uh, uh, mental disorder as compared to a really premeditative type of issue. And this was an individual who, whatever disorder he may have had, really did not have any problem with him forming the premeditation. So um, I think it's important for the prosecution to show that in order to rebut the idea that this is going to be some impact of some type of uh, autistic disorder. That Now, this is a guy who may, who may have been somewhere on the spectrum, but this was premeditated, careful behavior by him that lasted a very long time. And he could have backed out. He could have changed. He could have done a lot of other things. And the defense is about to argue that, look, he has diminished capacity. He cannot form the requisite intent necessary for first degree murder. Now let's hear how they articulate that in their opening statement. Take a look. Let's really ask the million dollar question here, Michael, okay? Is, have you ever seen a successful defense where the defense is my client was a, is a autistic, he is on the spectrum, or she is autistic and on the spectrum, and therefore you jury should find this person not guilty because if you look at the intent necessary, if you look at the elements of this crime, they could not form that intent. They could not have the mental capacity to commit this crime. Have you ever seen that work and ever be successful? I haven't seen it work uh, as far as an autistic defense is concerned. Uh, and the insanity defense generally, contrary to public uh, perception, works less than 5% of the time. Uh, juries routinely reject uh, situations in which defendants raise mental capacity issues. We still live in a world where people kind of think, you know, take responsibility for your conduct. And I've been involved in cases and seen cases in which the, the, the behavior of the defendant has been just so extreme, so crazy, and juries have still rejected it. Uh, so uh, this is a very, very hard argument to make, particularly when you have a functioning individual. Uh, and you can be uh, autistic and hold a job. You can be autistic and do a lot of things that require deliberation and content and knowledge. So you have to demonstrate that the, the the nature of the mental illness is so severe that you could not either distinguish between right and wrong or appreciate the wrongfulness of your conduct. That is a very, very high standard. Were you surprised when you see this case, and yes, there were mental health professionals that were called to talk about uh, autism in the spectrum, but I personally didn't see family and friends of Nicholas go to John come onto the stand and say any difficulties he had in his life or how he wasn't able to function um, you know, in society as other people would. And, and the fact that maybe you didn't see that, I'm curious what you thought of that because there are, that's their defense. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, sometimes defense lawyers don't want to uh, take the chance of putting on a lay witness, that a person who's not an expert, to testify to things that could 
kind of uh, muck things up, uh, where you have an expert saying something, sometimes you put a lay witness on, all of a sudden through cross-examination, they start saying things that you regret. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, we have a lot more to cover in this case. We're going to talk more about Nicholas Godijan right after this break. Crime scene photos really do tell a story. I'm back here with Michael Bachner to ask really a different question, though. What is the defense's ultimate goal here? Remember, they conceded the fact he committed this killing, but they're arguing that he was manipulated by Gypsy Blanchard. So what would be their ultimate goal? Is to, to get a not guilty verdict? Well, I think the ultimate goal really here is a diminished capacity type of defense. That is, uh, you're trying to get a reduction in the, in the level of culpability and the level of uh, of responsibility of a defendant by arguing that although he may have committed the conduct because of some mental uh, impairment, whether it's alcohol sometimes, whether it's uh, drugs, uh, etc., that that reduced his ability to form the requisite intent to act intentionally, but it did not, and it reduces it to the level where he may have acted either negligently, carelessly, or recklessly, reducing the level of exposure that the defendant has in a criminal case. But they would also be happy with, hey, if the jury, they convince the jury this is a pretty sympathetic guy, he's the victim in this case, then, hey, you, if you find him not guilty of anything, that would be great, because at the end of the day, the question is, who's the victim here? Is it Nicholas Godijan? Is it Gypsy Blanchard? Is it Dee Dee Blanchard? Was it everybody? Let's play now, though, in case you missed it. This is the forensic investigator from the medical examiner's office who's going to talk about the wounds sustained by Dee Dee Blanchard. And this also tells a story. Take a look. Of Ms. Blanchard's back taken from the right side. And there are numbers there. Uh, what do those signify? Um, Dr. Harkey numbered each wound, um, and this shows the numbers 1 through 14 um, for the stab wounds on the back. And of those 14 wounds there on the back, were there certain ones that uh, caused significantly more damage than others? Um, of these wounds, wound number 3, number 5, number six, number seven, number 12, and number 14 um, penetrated into the chest cavity um, and a couple of them on into the abdominal cavity of Ms. Blanchard. And if you go ahead and flip to State's Exhibit 41, what is this exhibit? Um, this is a photograph that uh, I initialed when I circled those six wounds. These are pretty brutal wounds, and I want to talk about it. Michael, the idea of, I mean, we knew that he stabbed her. Does it matter how he stabbed her, how many times, where he stabbed her? Does that, is that a really big factor when you're talking about first-degree murder? Well, uh, it's interesting. Sometimes one or two stabs may indicate that a person just acted out of some impulse and there was, oh my God, and stopped. It could indicate that the person was very good at what they did and it didn't have to stab very much more and they were just experts in doing it. So one or two could indicate a good premeditation. Um, but oftentimes, how many times you stab uh, could indicate whether you're acting on some crazy impulse, whether it's some heat of anger that you couldn't control yourself. Um, so, and uh, the angle of the wound could indicate whether the person uh, was acting in a defensive fashion or was acting in an, in an aggressive fashion. So all of these, all of these, the number of wounds, the angle of the wounds, how often the wounds came between each other, even the, even the space between the wounds. Um, these are all indicative of things that experts look at in, in, in determining things. But, you know, the wounds weren't the only thing that we learned about at the actual crime. We know that when Gypsy Blanchard testified, she said that Go to John asked if she wanted him to rape her mother. What? So the idea that he wanted to do that or came up with that idea, what did you make of that? Well, it, it certainly indicates a level of, a, a level of evilness, if I might uh -huh, say, sure. um, and a level of... Uh, thought that this is not just an impulsive individual killing someone, but out to really um, inflict um, other types of, of conduct. And it's what, what's also weird is the fact that you're right. comfortable asking her this question. That's the most bizarre aspect of it all. Listen, we got to hit a quick break, but when we come back, a lot more to discuss with Michael. We'll be right back. 
All right, so that was the cab driver that actually dropped off Nicholas Godijohn at Gypsy's house, and we know what happened then. He ultimately stabbed her to death, uh, Dee Dee Blanchard, of course, I'm talking about. Um, but, Michael, i got to ask you, this: we can't talk about this case without focusing on Gypsy Blanchard, mm -hmm. who was an active participant in this, and we believe that she was in the bathroom while the stabbing actually occurred. She heard it go down. If she went to trial, we all know that she pled guilty to second-degree murder, faces 10 years in prison, might actually be up for parole in 2021. If she took this to trial, would she have a successful defense that my mother suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, I was the victim of being confined to a wheelchair, forced to shave my head, I was improperly malnourished, I'm the victim of child abuse, I, this, I had to get free of her, this is the only way. Well, you know, it's kind of the defense that uh, in the old days, um, the battered woman defense or battered husband defense, where someone felt that the only way out of this horrible situation was to kill the spouse. Um, that's a very difficult defense to propose because jurors look at and, jur and judges instruct the jury about the ability, the level of duress. Can you get out? Do you have an ability to call law enforcement? And there is a good amount of premeditation even by her here. After the murder's committed, uh, they empty the safe and they do a lot of other stuff kind of consistent with someone who's acting out of perhaps a financial motive and other types of motives, not necessarily a Munchausen by proxy situation. It would be a very, a very, in my opinion, a very difficult um, defense for uh, for it to propose. Even of the Menendez brothers, where you had all this information about sexual abuse and battery, et cetera, and we saw how that verdict um, certainly initially went. The jury can only take so much. And what we're talking about right now is the premeditation aspect of what Nicholas Godijohn was charged with first degree murder. We listened to how he was dropped off at the house. Let's listen to John Harmon, another cab driver who picked Gypsy and him up after the killing. Take a look. We're learning all the steps that were taken, but was this a deliberate act? Did Nicholas go to John premeditate on this? Was this planned out? Because if so, that really does look like first degree murder, even if he is an autistic individual. I'm back here with Michael, Ma Michael Bachner to talk about this. So Michael, you and I were just talking about this in the break, right? Even forget the fact what their defense is, that you know he can't form the requisite intent because of uh, him being an autistic individual. The idea here, though, do you think that she really did take advantage of him and tried to get a willing accomplice to this crime because of his condition? I mean, because he's an autistic individual, is that, do you believe that? Well, it certainly sounds like that's part of the, their whole synergy together and their kind of how, how they, the yin and the yang of their relationship. But it's interesting. She is somebody, as a result of what she went through with her mother, that is her mother um, casting on her all these diseases probably would help her understand how she could actually manipulate another person who has a disease um, and perhaps take advantage of that type of situation. And it's clear he suffers from something, and it's clear she wanted this thing done. She pled guilty to it, and she um, and she she's testified against him. So uh, I, I think there is this where they they kind of like working off of he. Off of, off of each other. But at the end of the day, uh, the issue is really going to be whether or not he made an independent decision to engage in the conduct he get engaged in, not whether she may have manipulated him. I, I want to touch upon what you said, though, that she, as being a victim of manipulation for her entire life, she almost became an expert in manipulation. Right. Is that something you see in your practice, people who have that upbringing, one way or another, if they were taught to lie and cheat their, by their parents, that they ultimately become that person. I mean, is that something that's consistent with what you've seen? And we're assuming that she manipulated him. But again, that's, is that something that you've seen? Well, it, um, everyone's really the product of the environment they live in. So I've certainly seen it in white collar offenses where stockbrokers, for example, who uh, you know, live their lives um, uh, and come these penny stock cases, lying to people and manipulating people. And Wolf of Wall Street. A Wolf of Wall Street, who I cross-examined for three days. At the end of the day, um, these are people who can train other people. Um, to actually find the weaknesses in the people they call. Uh, and a lot of these people who actually are trained to do this um, have those similar types of, there's an old line, the easiest person to sell is someone who sells. Um, <laughs> they, they actually, so it's, uh, uh, there is that, 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 type of, uh, that type of relationship that goes on. Okay, so now if you sit in the defense's seat and you're listening to this and they're playing all this evidence about him taking the cab and planning this out and wanting to stab her and wanting to rape her and all this, is it possible? How would you argue as the defense attorney, well, that might all be true, but this still isn't premeditation? How would you argue that? Well, you know, uh, you would have to try and argue that um, as a result of the, the disease you're suffering, that you were brought into a situation and 
you were not going to engage in the conduct and the manipulative conduct that was brought upon perhaps by Gypsy to put you in that position and it kind of over, overcame your ability to act in, in, in an appropriate way and as a result of the condition you have on the autistic uh, on the autistic scale, um, you were someone easily manipulated, easily brought into another type of reality. Very hard arguments to make, candidly. Very hard argument because autism is not a disease. It's not really uh, a defect. It's just something that he was uh, he was born an autistic individual. So it's very difficult to argue this as opposed to, as you said, like an insanity defense or something else. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, a lot more to discuss. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. We are switching gears right now, and we are talking about our courtroom that we will be live in today. That's right, let's talk about Chris Watts. Chris Watts pled guilty to the murders of his wife, Shanann, and also their two baby girls, four-year-old Bella and three-year-old Celeste. The actual cause of death of all three is sealed. We don't know what the medical examiner's report is as of yet, but we do know he pled guilty. We believe he pled guilty because he wanted to escape the death penalty, and today we'll begin his sentencing phase. And this should be something to watch because he pled guilty to nine felony counts, including five counts of first-degree murder, unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. He could face at least three life terms in prison without the possibility of parole. And uh, this is just a really incredible case. We have a special report talking more about it. And in case you don't know anything about this whole situation, take a look. Chris Watts, the man who admitted to murdering his pregnant wife, Shanann, and their two young daughters, Celeste and Bella, will be sentenced on Monday. Watts pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder, two counts of murdering a child, one count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased body. The case drew national attention in August after Watts publicly pleaded for his family's safe return one day after reporting them missing from their Colorado home on August 13th. I, I mean, right now I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like, I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids, but I mean, could she have been, could she have just taken off? I don't know, but if somebody has her and they're not safe, like, I want them back now. Like, that, that, that's what's in my head. Like, if they're safe right now, they're going to come back. But if they're not safe right now, that's, what, that's the not knowing part. Like, if they're not safe, I, I, last night I was, had every light in the house on. I was hoping that I would just get, just ran over by the kids running in the door and just, like, barrel rushing me. But it didn't happen. And it was just a traumatic night trying to be here. Watts was arrested one day later and led the police to the bodies. He confessed to driving them to the property of the oil and gas company where he worked. He buried his wife in a shallow grave and dumped Celeste and Bella in oil barrels, he said. Watts admitted to killing his wife but claimed he only did it after she killed the children, aged three and four. He stated he saw Shannon actively strangling them on the baby monitor, but when he arrived, they were both dead. Watts' plea deal spared him from the death penalty, though he faces life in prison. For the Long Crime Network, I'm Rachel Stockman. Always, Michael, as we watch this case, you see the porch interview, right? We know that he changed his stories about what ultimately happened. He eventually pled guilty. How does someone look in the face of a camera to the whole world and just lie? How does that happen? It's really remarkable, uh, the ability of some people who are, have this, I'm, I'm going to call them psychotic, but not in the medical sense, this ability to divorce themselves from the criminality, horrible, just banal type of evil they've created, just killing a wife and your children and the method which they did it. And to be able to look into camera it takes a special kind of evil. Um, and it's this need to self-protect, etc. And he came across as, you know, kind of credible looking, you know. He seemed, uh, didn't seem in total shock, um, hoping they're still alive, etc. And, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting, his slip of the tongue when he was talking about there, he said he hoped his kids would come home and barrel into him. And, of course, we know what he did with his children. Um, I mean, so it's really... I, I, why do you think he took a plea deal here? I mean, what, what is it really? He didn't want to even try this 
uh, take it to trial. What do you think was going on in the, their defense team? Well, uh, I think the defense, defense lawyers in cases like this are doctors in the emergency room. Um, their job is to stop the patient from dying. And uh, they know that uh, there's no way that he's ever going to have a normal life. They know way he's never going to really be acquitted of this case, given his statements and the nature of the evidence. And their job is to try and save his life. So uh, they sat him down and said, your options are as follows. You can go to trial, be convicted, and uh, there's a substantial chance you could get the death penalty. You take this plea, you'll live the rest of your life in jail, but you know what? You're still alive. Um, that's, that's, and I think clients have to make those horrible choices. We don't know why this happened. Really, we don't know why he did this, or the motive here is not entirely clear, but we know some information's been coming forward since the sentencing will be happening. In fact, the woman who claims that she was having an affair with Chris Watts did an interview uh, with Denver 7 News, and she called what happened to Shanann and her daughters horrific. And she said that Chris lied about everything during the relationship, and that uh, also lied about what actually happened to Shanann and his two daughters. I'm curious, why do you think this is coming out now? Do you think that, sh how do you think she's gonna play in the overall arc of this story? I, I think she's just relevant for uh, sentencing purposes and for purpose and, and, and to give some, some context to what, what happened here, but it's really for sentencing purposes. And, and look, these are not, it's not that unusual to hear stories where people who want to change their lives and they consider the families they have to be an obstacle into what they should have and what they should be. You have you know, the, uh, the, the Casey Anthony case, which of course she was acquitted on and the evidence wasn't there, apparently a jury found. But the argument was that a child was killed because it kind of interfered with the lifestyle she wanted to have. And you, you have these types, of, uh, these types of cases. They're not that unusual. Um, for people who have, are either overly narcissistic and feel it's all about them and their families are obstacles. Um, but that's, I think, what this woman is coming out to say. That um, The classic example is you had an affair, you do anything to be with that person. Now, again, we don't know exactly right. what happened. And we're trying to predict what's going to happen today when victim impact statements are read. There's a bizarre turn of events that happened with Chris Watts's family, his parents in particular. I want to talk about that. They wrote a letter to the judge uh, alleging that Watts had been coerced into taking this plea deal, that his constitutional rights were denied, and that they attempted to make an appearance in this matter. The judge denied that, but said that they can speak out during the victim impact statements because they are, in fact, victims since their grandchildren were killed. So, Michael, what is going on here? It's a weird thing. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, the, the issue of a defendant being coerced into taking a plea happens all the time. Defendants feel uh, they, they feel like, oh, we made a mistake, or they, they just want to retract, they want to go to trial. But he's not saying this, his parents are. Uh, and the fact that his parents are saying that raises no constitutional issues for the judge. As far as the judge is concerned, unless this defendant raises the issue that he was coerced into a plea and wants to move to withdraw it, which is candidly an enormously difficult thing to do. Um, at the end of the day, you know, this is a weird thing. And then to be given the right to speak at the sentencing, I'm not sure what that's all about. What are they going to get up there and say, that my son is innocent and that he didn't do anything wrong? How is that a statement on behalf of the victims? Well, what's their leeway? What can they actually say? I mean, what, they want to come on there and they they're technically allowed because they are the grandparents of two of the, the two girls. So the, normally what would happen is they would come on and say, hey, you know, this was a horrible crime. My granddaughters were killed. But here, what's their leeway? What can they actually argue? What well, can they generally, say? like you said, um, uh, Jess, they would get up there and they would say, you know what? Uh, this is a horrible case, but please show mercy on, on the defendant. You know, even though he did this horrible thing, they can come out and say things like that. But they're going to go up there and say, this is a horrible crime. My grandkids were killed, but he didn't do it. Uh, that's not really a victim impact statement um, because you're not really showing the impact on the victim as far as the defendant is concerned. Uh, so I think the judge may feel statutorily under the law they have a right to speak, but they give it little or no credence. And frankly, I think it could be harmful for, for this defendant, ultimately. The world will be watching today, and hopefully they're all watching here on Law and Crime, which I hope you do, because we're going to be live in that courtroom. Do you think Chris Watts will make a statement? Well, it's interesting. If I were the judge on this case to protect this record, I would say to this defendant, I would make it clear that you are not raising any issues as far as your, your guilty plea is concerned, so that ultimately down the road, depending on what his sentence is, does he raise some other appeal out there and say that, you know, my parents told you about this coercion and I was, you know, told to be quiet about it, etc. I'd get the judge to talk about it. What he should do up there, just talk about how sorry he is, remorseful he is. It won't, it won't matter on his sentence. He's going to be getting um, life sentences anyway. Oh, yeah. This is 
definitely something to watch. We are going to be live in that courtroom, we believe, maybe in an hour or so. But if something should happen before, we're going to go up there and watch that. So that is the Chris Watts sentencing. That's a live feed into the courtroom. Obviously, nothing's happening yet. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Everybody, welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Thanks for joining us. Busy day here on the network. We are first going to be covering the Nicholas John trial, talking a little bit more about it. And the verdict came in, so we're talking more about this man who was on trial for the murder of Dee Dee Blanchard, his girlfriend's mother, trying to understand why this happened, what the defense is going to be arguing, because they argued that he is an autistic individual on the spectrum, manipulated by Gypsy Blanchard, his girlfriend, to commit this crime, and that anything jury, you shouldn't find him guilty of first degree murder, maybe something less, because he couldn't form the requisite intent necessary. Uh, Dee Dee was found dead in her home, stabbed to death, a pretty brutal crime. And Gypsy Blanchard has been portrayed as the mastermind behind all of this. She testified in connection with this trial, testified on behalf of the defense. She took most of the blame, and we're, you know, we're going to talk more about if that worked or not. And we can't forget the fact that Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which it's believed that Dee Dee Blanchard suffered from, and uh, you could say that Gypsy Blanchard was the victim of herself, really becomes a big factor in this case. So, before we talk about go to John, um, and before we talk about the Chris Watts sentencing, I just want to say, Michael Bachner, who is our guest today, really, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Great to have you. Yeah, thank you. Can't wait to have you back. Awesome. All right.